point soon. Next up uh, is Eric from Quantifind. So a uh, quick comment in between talks. The speakers that you see here today with their uh, use cases are, um, are people that we know, as you can tell, people that we work with as a lab. Uh, it's in their best interest as startups to attach themselves to something like the AMP Lab. And there are a lot of, a lot of startups in the audience, and the, the way that they've started doing this, most of, the, most of the people you'll see is by coming to the Spark meetups. So there are basically monthly meetups now. We've been getting 50, 60 people at most of them. And uh, just seeing how things work, getting to know the other members of the community, talking about how they're using Spark, getting support from the team, and just in, uh, in an organic way, building up a relationship. And as you can see, they get, they get the opportunity at an event like this to give a slide that says they're hiring. So uh, if you're interested in having so that sort of relationship, we suggest <laughs> that, you that you make an effort to let us know what pains you're solving with your products. Um, and you know, use Spark. So uh, here's Eric at Quantifind. <laughs> they're hiring too. So I, I was hoping Andy would mention my sexy shirt, but that didn't happen for some reason. So uh, thanks for uh, for coming. So um, you know, like like all startups uh, at Quantify, we basically have the entire s stack running on open source. And so I was more than happy to talk about you know Spark because I think it works actually really well. And you know the problem with open source is that there's so much out there that if you don't talk to people, you actually don't know what works well, or you spend a lot of time just trying it. And so um, glad to talk about it. So. Um, what I have for the next 30 minutes, and feel free to um, jump in and ask questions because I'm, I've only about two slides, so I really depend on questions to make my 30 minutes. Um, so please jump in and ask questions. We have already a question over there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, so let's let's first. You know, I'm sure no one knows Quantify, so let's give a, a quick little, you know, sense of you know what Quantify does. And then let's talk about why we actually are not using Hadoop anymore. Um, and, then, and then maybe you know, think, think about some of the architectural choices you can make and, uh, and sort of the process you should go through to find out the, the things that actually uh, matter in terms of where you spend your resources and money on. Um, and, then, and then just you know, reflect a little bit about like, what are the things that you should keep in mind if you run um, Spark, and for that matter, probably pretty much any production system. Um, and I do have some time reserved for questions, but I hopefully won't need, be able to need that. So what does Quantify do? So I can't show the demo right now, but I'm more than happy if you know, people come, come to me afterwards to show them the actual product. Um, so I have to describe it in a little, few more words. So essentially we have products for, for several different verticals. For example, for the entertainment industry in Hollywood, um, or for you know, uh, video game producers. And so what we essentially do is we try to gain, uh, get as much uh, publicly available uh, uh, unstructured and structured information. So for example, could be tweets, could be comments on blog posts about these products, could be product reviews on Amazon. And what we are then doing is we slurp in essentially a few years worth of data. So for example, for movies, we would look at the last four years worth of um, uh, publicly available comments about movies. And it will build a model that tells us how a comment relates to a structured field or a KPI that we care about. So a simple example is if I say this movie sucks, I'm very unlikely to actually go to the movie theater and watch it. And so the point is that we have a model that is a little more complex than that. Uh, you know, the if then else, if the movie sucks, then person won't go there. And, and so what we essentially are able to do is we are able to correlate comments with a structured field that you care about and show you if you know, the comments change any which way, whether that would influence your revenue, your customer satisfaction, um, and so on. And so the point is, for example, for the movie industry is we're able to find out what the uh, intentful audience is. So that's basically the audience that would actually go to the movie theater and watch that movie. And so on the right-hand side, you see the intentful audience, that's for uh, The Amazing Spider-Man. So you see the intentful audience is you know, big into Simpsons and Cartoon Network and Adventure Time. And when we actually built that UI, you would see you know, many of these panels, you would see the movie, you would see some basic information about that movie, and all these panels are actually computed in real time on Spark. So you bring up the UI, 
and we actually kicked jobs off to compute these because as a small startup, if you think about it, one of the things that we don't want to spend your time on is if product management has a new feature that they want to push out to have these specialized data structures around that compute exactly just this panel. So in our case, what we do instead, we just compute it on demand on the fly and we can essentially answer uh, any question they have as long as we have, of course, the data already queued up in memory. And so in this case, you see, you know, we have a list of comparable movies. So for another action movie, we would show them how well they're doing. So for example, for Simpsons, they're doing actually, you know, pretty well with a successful movie. If you go to NCIS, apparently they haven't captured all the NCIS watchers. So if they would wanted to maximize the people actually watching the movie, they should probably focus on that um, audience. But in general, you see that movie is doing pretty well. There's no red in it. So, you know, Superman was obviously a pretty successful movie in terms of the, um, you know, just overall ticket sales. Any other questions? Sure. Yeah, Facebook pages, you know. Yeah, and, and you know, you basically, depending on the vertical, that, that source might be different. And so, you know, we, we try and pick sources that we already have feeds for. Otherwise, you know, that's just another hurdle. Yeah. How is that easy to start to build a computer? That, that's that's, a very, good that's a very good question. So the, the question is, how do we get historical data uh, for Twitter? And so as you know, you can get data going forward uh, through, you know, the filtered fire hose, for example, for free, if you stick within certain limits. If you want to get historical data, um, we got it from DataSift. Uh, they have um, just come out with a prog program where essentially they would allow you to create a query and that query can run over like a, a, a historical you know, period of time. Um, but we have, you know, we're funded by Andreessen Horowitz, so we had sort of, you know, so an inroad and it was a lot more hand coded and hand run than then you, you could done like by being a regular customer on the website. And I think they're coming online with, you know, getting historical data, the data online. But it's like, I think 10 cents for a thousand tweets or so. It, you know, it's, it's not cheap. Um, Eric, perhaps I don't understand, but how does time change the results, whether it's the intent by interest group or the demographics of the intentful audience? So the question was, how do we? How does it change? Oh, how does it change over time? Yeah, so that's a good point. So, you know, we have, we have several views on the data. So this one is, is pretty static. It's, it's from the, let's say they, they put out, you know, they start earlier and earlier with the movie. So they start with production pictures like a year or maybe earlier when the actual movie comes out. And so this one would be really like o accumulate data over the entire year. So from today to tomorrow, there probably won't be any change really in the data because it's such a tiny little slice. And so what we also have, we have other views that essentially allows them to, okay, I put out this message, how did it actually impact the, the audience demographics or the, you know, the, the drivers? We also compute drivers, what gets people into the movie theater? Good, we have to move along, too many questions, sorry. Okay. I, first time they see this, <laughs> I swear. <laughs> So, um, so we're funded by Andreessen Horowitz, pretty small company, 17 people. Oh, and Redpoint. Um, we have money to pay proper salaries. Uh, we're right now we have three large movie studios in production. So, you know, if you know, more than happy to talk to to you in if you want to, um, you know, talk about what we're, you know, what the opportunities are. So it's jobs at quantifying.com. So um, I've been I've been using Hadoop since 2007, so I was running the first uh, Bay Era Hadoop meetings before, you know, Yahoo took over. And so I went, of course, to the Hadoop summit, which was, you know, a month or two ago. And uh, then, you know, you start up, strike up a, ca a casual conversation. So what are you using Hadoop for? And of course, I said, I don't. And then most people, th they think you're an idiot because you're not using Hadoop. And so I figured we should maybe talk about why we're not using Hadoop. And so it started out pretty innocently where, you know, we were running, uh, uh, we were first running cascading, which worked pretty well, but then the data scientists said, hey, you know what, why don't we use pig A, because everyone apparently uses it, and B, we have a command line shell, and we could actually try things iteratively. So the idea is that all the algorithms that you develop, we could, you know, co-jointly use. And so we were suffering through uh, probably three, four weeks of really pig pain, because it was, 
the run times were slow, the error messages were incomprehensible, um, flattened, I don't know how it works. Um, uh, and so what we, what we actually found then as an experiment was that actually writing these Spark jobs is a lot quicker than writing um, you know, pig jobs. So the velocity for the team was a lot higher. And so initially we didn't expect necessarily that the runtime would be also a lot better. And so that got us started with, with Spark and then ultimately also got us started with Scala. And so by now, you know, we're Jav we were a Java shop and now pretty much exclusively Scala. I mean, no one really wants to touch the old uh, Java stuff anymore. So, I mean, if you saw these old, you know, I mean, not the old, but the slides yesterday for like Java versus Scala. I mean, if, if you're willing to learn a new language, I encourage you because uh, you won't go back in my opinion. But then what we also uh, found out is that the runtime for the stuff we do, which is, uh, you know, we're re rerunning essentially the same algorithm over and over just with slightly different parameters um, is, is really orders of magnitude faster. So our pig jobs used to take for a certain thing, for example, an hour and it got down to like tens of seconds. Uh, and so while, you know, that initially wasn't really a driver because, you know, an hour was still good enough for us, it in the end enabled us to, for example, you know, drive the UI completely from uh, Spark jobs. Um, and so that for us, like I said, was, was a pretty big deal because we could, um, instead of having either specialized data structures or try to compute everything in advance and just pull out the pre-computed answer, uh, we could, which, you know, limits, of course, how many things you can do because if you can, you know, drag and drop and compare anything by anything, there are probably too many <laughs> permutations. We could basically offer features very quickly without needing to develop these specialized structures or, or try and pre-compute everything. Any questions? Good. And so if, you, if you're a small company, there are obviously a limited amount of resources and money. And so I think it's very important that you think about um, you know, what do you want to actually fortify? What do you make redundant and what do you actually not make redundant? Because essentially, you know, most people think everything has to be redundant and it's, it's the best thing ever, but with redundancy, typically problems arise as well. So I think it's important that you spend some time thinking about what do I need to fix right away because I'm missing the tweets and is ir irreplaceable versus, you know, where do I have a few hours you know, you know, working by myself a few hours because no one notices. Um, and so what we did, for example, in our case, the UI, if the UI is not there, I mean, that's very easily noticeable. You get, you know, some error 500 if you're, if you're lucky, and then the customer will call and, and, and you wanna make sure that this never happens. And so in the architecture slide, I'll show you what we did because we're, we're a little bit of a, like a, a not bleeding, maybe leading edge because we run, actually we drive the UI from Spark. I think, you know, we had to do certain things because we know that that, that is a real possibility. And then, you know, there's also the, the case where, you know, the UI isn't down, but the data isn't obviously super fresh and you can buy yourself a few hours. So if the data processing time is quick enough, I don't have to get out, out of bed. I can basically, you know, you know hamper along with, with some stale data. Maybe most people won't even notice it. Um, and then, you know, if you lose tweets, they're gone. So you probably have to have something there that is always making sure it's, um, you know, it, 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 some, some, someone catches those, those tweets or whatever other data source you have. Any questions? No? Whew. I need to probably s change slides slow so we make it through 30 minutes. Okay, so, so what does the architecture look like? So a while ago, we, we essentially had you know, the problem that there was too much work to do and we had too few people. Of course, we're trying to hire like mad, but then also the other choice you can do, you can make is um, just go back and look at your stack and see and rip out everything that doesn't work. And hopefully you rip it out with something that works better, of course. And so, you know, Pig was one of these candidates with Hadoop that was just really painful to, you know, develop these, these iterative algorithms, so we ripped that out. And we essentially came up with a pretty fresh stack. And of course there's a risk if you have new things that A, you need to develop expertise, B, the new thing might not work better. But uh, so over time we arrived at this and it has been working out pretty well. And so everything with a, with a big R is something that is redundant. Um, 
because you know it would actually you know cons you know cause some harm to the system or the user experience, and so you see right now we're pushing all the feeds and also the crawlers run in storm. I'm hoping to change that in the future with Spark streaming. The only thing I need, you know, if if you if you run storm, you essentially uh, create what they call a topology that describes essentially how the data flows through the system. And then once you submit that, it runs in the system. It doesn't matter if a node goes up or down. The, the, you know, it will keep it running and basically bring up those bolts and spouts on other nodes that, that went down. I, there's, there's nothing that attaches me from the con console to the actual um, you know, storm cluster. And so as soon as that is in there, I'm going to try it. So the R for redundant on storm is that's functionality that's built into storm. That yeah. you're talking about. You didn't do anything special on top. Uh, correct. And, and so you know, th there, there are sort of failure conditions, like if the, the Nimbus, which is like the head node, goes down, you can't uh, schedule new um, topologies, and you can't, I think, uh, rebalance them. Um, so if another machine would go down, it would actually not restart it. But you have a few hours probably to restart Nimbus or replace that machine. It, it doesn't automatically stop processing because essentially it just launches these Java processes and they all talk to each other through zero and queue. There, there's really no coordination at that point required. And so that's why you know, the built-in redundancy for these, for these systems was actually uh, pretty important for us. Because um, you know, like I said, if Justin Bieber me, uh, tweets are missing, you know, I'll be quite something. And so, so we do also use it for non-traditional, I guess, you know, intended usage, like we run our Facebook crawlers on there. So we would, for example, kick off a topology. The input tuple would be, for example, crawl this page, and then we would have an entire topology that goes out and, and you know, pulls these things out, which would be, which is obviously more batchy and probably more suited for like a Sparky architecture. Um, but you know, because this is reliable, even like a simple thing like a cron, to make that reliable. Of course, I can bring up a zookeeper and have then a master election and that thing kicks off the job. But this is basically built in for free so I don't have to worry about it. Um, so that was why we abused it uh, to do other things as well. Then in terms of the, the, the created data, so all the feeds, all the tweets, everything that, was, that we um, got from Storm gets pushed into Cassandra. So Cassandra has really, really dirt cheap writes because it does append only. And so in our case, that was good because for a lot of these things, we don't immediately look at it. And so if writes are cheap, that means I can also absorb you know, large swings in terms of you know, a new data coming in. Um, and you know, Cassandra by itself is, is um, redundant. And so you know, that was a, a, a good benefit. That's why also you know, HBase, you know, while HBase itself is fall, fall tolerant, the name node is not. And so you know, it, it was not really a good, a good match for us. And then essentially, the only thing that isn't redundant is sort of this batch cluster. So the idea behind it that is that um, we have you know, two Spark clusters, and hopefully in the future we can be a little more smart about that and have maybe a, a joint cluster that has, has guarantees around that. But essentially, this batch cluster you know, is not redundant because if it's down for a few hours, you know, it's not good, but we can sort of rerun the data. And, and recover. We haven't lost anything. We show a little bit stale data, but in general, life is good, uh, or good-ish, I guess. And then on the right-hand side is sort of, I guess, where we do things a little different than some other Spark users. We essentially have um, a REST API on top of Spark, and then we have our data that drive the UI loaded in memory. And when a request comes in, we do the pro you know, processing in real time and push it out. And so for production, we recently started adding like a little, you know, EH cache layer on top of it. But that's really, you know, the jobs are done in, you know, a second maybe or so. Um, I, can, I can show you some real world examples. And so it's, it's really not required. It's just, you know, making it even more snappy. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cheap and small. And so we have a load balancer on top of it uh, that just sprays over these RESTful Spark instances that, you know, answer the request. Um, and so like, like all the other system, we collect you know, logs and stats and we push those all into Kafka because Kafka also has really super dirt cheap writes and keep data around for a long time because essentially just this file appends and then when the file is essentially ready to get thrown out because it's either your maximum amount of data sizes reach or because it's older than what you would um, expect, it just tosses the entire file. And so it's very cheap, keep lots of data around, writes are cheap, and so 
uh, we essentially pump everything into, into Kafka, even if there's not an immediate consumer um, you know, for this data. Uh, because what we found is essentially, you know, we had, for example, Brian said, oh, I want some tweets. And so I can just consume tweets um, from you know, our filtered uh, fire hose directly without me doing anything because I just published it. And if it goes to the ether, hey, who cares? And so that's, that's a nice property. And then also, of course, you know, logs. If you have more than a f handful of machine, you can do things like Capistrano with like a distributed tail. But in, ge in general, it gets pretty tedious in terms of, you know, troubleshooting. So if you want to discover trends or search for things, it's much better if you push that into a system that, that central, you know, in a, in a central fashion lets you allow to look at the data. Uh, so, f uh, so, so the question was, what do you mean by redundant? I, and, and I ask you, where? The Spark? Yeah, yeah. What do you mean? Oh, um, so redundant means that um, if it can tolerate single node failures. That's what I mean by redundant. So the system, like the, the machines can fail and the system would continue to work, maybe in a degraded fashion, but it wouldn't stop working. Any more questions? Why do you think the Spark? You know, the, the shared Spark is not redundant because it's it's doing the batch computation that feed those the, the standalone Spark. And so this if if this go down, we would basically need to rerun the job and we would be down, you know, for a couple hours. We would show stale data for a couple hours. That's why, you know, it's okay. Um, well, we do have certain feeds. Feed, oh, so wh why do we need a real-time processing engine? So, for example, for Twitter. So, Twitter is always producing streams, and we need to make sure they reliably get into Cassandra. So, of course, I could have written, you know, like some standalone process and have maybe Zookeeper and then let the master that connects to Twitter, and then that that thing goes down. Then the other thing would take over and pushes into Cassandra, but that's basically what I get here for free. So the, the, the stream processing I do is very, is very very primitive. It's essentially making sure reliably the streams get into Kafka and Cassandra. There's, there's really no, no fancy grouping, no fancy sorting. Reliability is the, the, the one thing I'm really looking for. Yeah, like the driver would be one of these things. Yeah. 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 Understand? Yeah. 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 So the question was, uh, or the, the statement was that, of course, this runs on Mesos. So if a Mesos node knows down, goes down, you know, in the like, like in the last um, or the, the the session in the morning, we found out that it doesn't stop anything. But then, of course, if the master goes down, you know, it wouldn't work. Um. So how did you guys decide over, like, say, Kafka versus Flume or Cassandra versus HBase or Storm versus, like, yeah. maybe, uh, uh, maybe the Storm might be easier because it's you wanted to do a real-time thing. But maybe some of the other things, like why Cassandra or HBase or why uh, Kafka or Flume or Scribe or okay. something else. So, so um, I tried a few messaging systems. So, okay, so... Between Kafka and Storm is easy. So Storm uses Xerom Q to talk, have the bolts talk to each other, and the bolts can be on separate boxes, and it's very efficient at that. The problem is, though, it's all memory bound. So if I would essentially, um, you know, have too much data pressure coming in, this thing would fall over. Kafka, I can have a lot of data because it's persisting it to disk, and writes are really cheap because essentially it, it, it creates a file of pens, a pens, a pens to it, and then just keeps an offset pointer around. So if I can't keep up with it, I mean, obviously, eventually I need to catch up with my data. But for like, like short bursts, it's very good in absorbing that additional write pressure. In Storm, what you can say, I can have only X couples in flight. And so it, you, know, you, could, you could sort of you know, uh, trigger, you can sort of, um, you know, um, sort of make sure that you, you don't have too much pressure on Storm. So I think Kafka is like a, is, has a different property than Storm. So most people that you talk, um, have also Storm probably buffered by Kafka, like like Twitter. I think they're going to move to you know Kafka in front of Storm. And right now they have Kestrel, which is also a queue. 
In terms of Kafka, Kafka is, I think, the, the first queuing system that I've seen that really works if you have lots of data and you want to keep it around for a while. Like all the others, they typically are database, um, database based. And so, you know, a database typically keep indi keeps indices around. And, and if you put more and more stuff in it, it typically doesn't, con like it, it doesn't uh, stay at the same uh, responsiveness level or st stay at the same, you know, um, speed level. And so they, they have to do a few, tr you know, sort of compromises. Like you can't just request any message that you haven't gotten in the past or it doesn't know which message you haven't gotten. It, it keeps this offset around. So I can say, you know, give me something back from a start like an hour back, but you, I would see all the messages from an hour back because it's really just a pointer moving forward in a file. So there are certain drawbacks, but for me, you know, those were acceptable. Then Flume, ooh, I tried in the beginning. It wasn't working all so well. There were some messages lost, and I think the whole thing was a little not my, my thing. Um, RabbitMQ, I think, is based on o OLTP from, uh, from um, you know, Erlang. And so they have other problems. I think in general it's just, uh, you know, it's not, it's not my thing. So and, and, and it's Cassandra versus HBase thing you saw What was it? It's Cassandra versus HBase or something. HBase, uh, like I think, um, they're just a lot of moving parts. You know, you sit on top of HDFS. So you have like a gazillion things running. And when your write pressure gets high, then typically things can fall over very quickly. There are also um, situations when you have a region split where things don't move at all because the region split is happening, there are no writes going in. Uh, didn't, it, it felt like too complicated for my what I was looking for. And there was a single point of failure. So essentially in that case, because there, there's no single point of failure, HBase does have, you would have you know, needed a buffer in between, otherwise you would lose data again. Good question. Um, right now we're Can pretty simple. Oh, so what's the, what's the um, how do we feed data from Cassandra into Spark? And so right now, um, I think there, there are two options. The first one is um, an input format. So you could, if you, if you have a lot of data, you can co-locate you know, Spark with your Cassandra nodes and the input format would take data locality into mind and would essentially not go over the network to fetch it unless it has to. Um, in our case, um, we don't have that much data because we do incremental dumps. And so what we do is, in, in, in Cassandra, there's an operation where you do a row scan. So give me everything in this block, in this batch, but only give me the keys. And so the actual information is pretty small. And then we have actually a distributed, um, you know, um, kind of like worker pool that pulls them. Where you tell you, like, this is the row pull out the data and then they'd pull it out and dump it into the file system. Because we found essentially that a lot of people, they know how to deal with files, but Cassandra has pretty poor ways to actually let you explore the data. There's not much there. I think that's one of their biggest drawbacks, that, that the actual database works really well, but the developer tools are sort of poor. Oh, I'm over time, okay. A few more slides. We can handle a few more questions. If oh, damn it. Well, we can, we can glance over those. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess Storm is getting data from the crawlers that are getting data from Datasheet or Facebook. I, I guess you access Facebook directly. Mm -hmm. So are these simple crawlers or you, let's say you get a tweet, you get a URL from that and then you analyze the web page that is refers from this yeah, URL? Yeah, th there's, uh, I, I, c I can show you other slides that talk about like what a Facebook topology would like look like. I can do that if you want. Okay, thanks. Sure. You know, we run pretty beefy machines, so they are typically 32 cores with 128 gigs of RAM, and so we have only, I think, four. Because we, we essentially run Proxmox on top of that, so we, we have a container virtualization that slices them into smaller ones up. So we buy rather large machines, and then for this one, we don't actually slice them up more, but, you know, I was interested in the Mesos talk and see maybe we can, um, maybe we can, you know, kick out Proxmox and run everything on Mesos, I guess it's the 2.0 version. Okay, and so, so I think th this is a very generic slide. So if you, if you run any production system, especially a distributed, which you know, if you process internet scale data, uh, probably you have to have more than one machine, then you need to make sure, of course, that you have something that tells you that it's up. And so I, of course, can't press refresh on my browser, so I use Uptime Robot um, that you know, sends me, sends me um, you know, direct messages from Twitter or SMSs. And then 
the, the one thing that most people when they write something don't actually think about is you turn it on and you claim it's, it's working and then the boss asks you how, how do you know? I mean, what, like how do you know it's working? I mean, I, I, I don't know. And so it's important to have like even simple things like counts and timings just in there so you know actually it's working because you have you know, a, a number of machines and it's not that easy to actually peek into a process and say, you know, is, you know, like confidently tell that it's working without that. And so in our case, we are a Scala shop, so you, know, you would see um, you know, Ostrich, um, which is a, a framework by Twitter to do you know, statistics. We would have a, like a timing query, for example, like this, which times this block. And then we'll push it into ca uh, Kafka and then have another topology that pulls it out and pushes it into Graphite because Graphite is, in, you know, is basically an RRD da database and so it's very easy to you know, just show like f fancy graphs like the one in the lower right. Then also with logging, we, we have a log for j appender and then push everything through Kafka into gray log. Um, and then you know, one of the things that with, with Java in general is, is sort of difficult is you know, they typically don't come with Etsy in it, the startup scripts. And so it's a pain for me to write them because I'm a sysadmin. And so supervisor daemon is a, is a simple way around it. You just give it a command line and a user and a working directory. And it just starts the process in foreground. If the process dies, it knows it immediately and restarts it and sends you an email if you want. So good. I think we're over time. Too many questions. Um, and so what's, what's next? I mean, I think, you know, Dilip said that before. I don't want to code it twice. And so I think Storm Trident and Spark Streaming are sort of going on a, on a collision course. They're trying to do this, the same thing essentially, which will probably be standard in a couple of years. Everyone will just ask, you know, why haven't we done this all the time? And then we also heard that, you know, RAM is, is, is way faster. And so, you know, even like small clusters, you, know, you can easily have a terabyte of, you know, of main memory. And so if you can just load it in memory, you can outperform you know, many, like, like any external storage by, by several factors. Uh, when did that, uh, I just did that, like, yeah. over the weekend. <laughs> How did you get to 70 gigabytes of that? Well, it, it depends. Basically, these are, I guess, synthetic benchmark numbers. And so it depends on whether you do a linear scan yeah, or, same, or you. Same benchmark. So this is not what actually arrives. This is what the chipset claims. So I should qualify that it's, right. it's probably lower if you, you know, pull it through Java or something where there's, like, you know layers over layers. But that's at least what they claim for like uh, linear scans in, in RAM. When I started learning at Peak with RAM running at 2,000 megahertz, I got about just over 20, uh, 20 gigs per second is what I got using okay. the same benchmark. Good, we'll fix it. Yeah, that was, that, that was way higher. Right? <laughs> good. <laughs> so, good. No, I want to know your secret. Yeah, no, it's, no, it's you know, you, you know, you, you basically you you go. No, this is we run. The, you know, the cheapest hardware we can get with a decent motherboard and and, and, and Intel processor. So, 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 so this is you go to you know uh, uh, you know um, any any of the review sites and they and they measure these. So I haven't measured. I have other. So we have now the official number, <laughs> which still is uh, is good. Crowdsourcing prevails again. You know, yeah, and so yeah, we're out of questions. Sorry. Thanks, uh, Eric, for your time. Okay.